Matthew 27, let's begin in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's pray together. Lord, we, uh, we ask, Lord, that you would be our teacher this morning. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us all the things you want to speak to us about. And we thank you that you want to speak to us. Thank you that we are on the receiving end of a loving Father giving instruction. And uniquely by your Holy Spirit, you're able to show us individually where we need to make adjustments, where we need to, what we need to repent of. Uh, what encouragement, Lord, you can speak to us. We trust. We trust that it's from a Father's heart. We know it's from a Father's heart, and we're grateful for that. So we yield to you. We pray that um, you would help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. Lord, we know that's all by your grace and by your power. And we know, Jesus, you talked about obedience to you. Hear your words and obeying them. You compare them to a man who builds his house upon a rock. And when the storms come, that house will stand. So help us to have obedience be something that marks our life. Uh, that is a characteristic, that's a typical characteristic, Lord, as you bear fruit through us. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I just have to admit as we start here that, um, I mean, in some sense, I never feel like I do the passage justice when I'm teaching it. And I think any honest Bible teacher will admit to that because we you, you have to teach higher than you live because what you're teaching is perfect and the standard is what it is. And obviously we don't want um, hypocrisy or anything like that. But you always feel unworthy and, and not able to fully communicate or do justice. That's, I guess, a, a, a way to say it. Do justice to a passage. And, this, and that's true all the time, uh, if you're being honest. But especially for, for this passage and what's going on in this passage... I feel more than normal. I feel ill-equipped and um, not worthy to teach it, uh, not worthy to um, to fully get across what what uh, it's supposed to what we're supposed to understand. And part of that has to do with a very healthy perspective in terms of Bible interpretation, which is to be silent where the Bible is silent. That's a real. That's a a, a principle in hermeneutics, that's the, stu the, the study of the art and study of biblical interpretation. It's called hermeneutics. One of the principles in hermeneutics is to be silent where the Bible is silent, to speak where the Bible speaks, to not read into silence, not make arguments from silence. And when you're getting into these things, especially with what was happening with the Lord Jesus in his heart and in his mind, and what happened between him and the Father uh, during that time on that cross, there's so much. There's so much different ways that that could take your mind and your heart, and 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 it's really hard to know what was really the case, uh, and and so we can we can you know uh, have good guesses and have, but it's just it, it it is for me it's been it's been good. I've enjoyed my study. Remember, I go through a lot before I ever come here on Sunday between the passage and me. And any good Bible teacher will have the the passage study them way more than they're studying. The passage and, and I've just been worked over, damn, worked over by this passage. Sorry, and so I just have this deep desire to explore it, but not go past what it's saying and not go short of what he wants me to say. <clears throat> so we're looking at the seven recorded statements from the cross, and I want to put them on the screen. The first one is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I think you can sum, sum up that uh, account that we looked at as with the word forgiveness there. Because as Jesus is being nailed to the cross, <clears throat> he is continuously saying, that's what the language says, continuously saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they're nailing them, these Romans, to the cross and doing what they did. So I believe that's the word that sums up that, at least in my view. Secondly, we saw uh, him say, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I believe that's summed up by the word grace because this, this, um, this thief was, was saved by the Lord Jesus. He extended his grace when the, when the thief had nothing to offer, just like we don't. It's just more obvious 
Because there's, God just eliminated all the other possibilities so that we can't misunderstand. He didn't have any opportunity to earn it, to work for it, to get baptized, to, the whole long list of things that you could say just eliminates that possibility. So there's, it just it totally puts the spotlight on the, on, on the heart of Jesus. As he, as he said, today you'll be with me in paradise to this thief, this thief that, that had been hurling blasphemies to him earlier, a few hours earlier, he was joining in with the other thief and the other people and, and, and blas- saying blasphemous things to the Lord Jesus. It's amazing how gracious God is. And I think that as we focus on grace and as we learn about grace, I'd recommend the book by Pastor Chuck Smith, Why Grace Changes Everything. We'll have that in our future uh, lending library where we'll have books that we can, we l- we'll lend out. And that's one of the main, I think every Christian should, should read that book, Why Grace Changes Everything by Pastor Chuck. So then we saw after that, we saw it last week where he said, woman, behold your son, behold your mother to John after he said that to Mary. And the word that could be summed up would be provision. He made provision for his mother. And even in the context of that incredible suffering, he's thinking of others. That's what we see as a, the whole entire time is he's thinking about others. So he made provision, and there's so much there. If you, didn't, if you weren't here last week, I'd recommend you going on our YouTube channel and, and watching that. By the way, our, our app is going to be coming in the next month or two, somewhere in there, We're working hard on it, um, and you'll have all the messages on the, on the app uh, easily for you to access. And then today we're going to look at, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then after that, we'll look at, I thirst, and and then it is finished. And then, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We might have two of those in one week. We'll see how the Lord leads. So the fourth statement from the cross is summed up today, I believe, by the word rejection. You could say abandonment or rejection, but I think rejection really hits it closer to that. Uh, and, and so we're going to look at this fourth statement of the cross with, with this whole idea of rejection, that Jesus was rejected. And Jesus needed to be rejected in the sense of God's plan. It was part of God's plan in terms of what needed to happen for us to be redeemed. And I believe the key idea is that Jesus had to be rejected or forsaken for the Father, by the Father on the cross. That had to happen. And, and, and it was necessary for our forgiveness. It was, it was, there wouldn't be one thing that happened to the Lord Jesus that wasn't necessary. Remember, the Father said multiple times, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Think about what you would allow your Son to go through for other people. If something had to happen, you had to allow your Son to go through something, you would only want to have the bare minimum, I mean, the, the, not too much, not too less, like exactly what had to happen no doubt that was the father's heart. So and that's what we've been looking at this as we've been going through the book of John, all the things that he went through from that arrest time when he was arrested all the way through um, this, this time where he's on the cross, all of that was necessary. But first we need to look at as part of that, what was happening in the physical realm. And that's what we're going to do first. Uh, and I'm not in any rush to go any through any of this, so I'm, I'm not trying to go fast. I'm not trying to go slow. I just want us to, to, to look at it. Again, I don't feel equipped. I don't feel uh, I do especially ill-equipped to deal with this, what was happening between he and the Father. But it says in verse 45, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Now in Luke, we're told that it says the whole earth, and there's a discrepancy regarding... The translation of the the word there that he that he, um, tra- he that Luke translates land or earth rather, the rest of them use land. He uses earth, and so some people say that uh, it was a worldwide darkness. Um, that could that could be. There are there are writers that were close to the time, like a hundred to hundred to two hundred years after the events, that had that quoted people and historians that. That made allusions to the fact that it was, uh, a, you know, like it was seen in other places, like in Egypt and Rome was. Uh, someone, one writer said, "You can check out the annals in Rome, and you'll see that it was dark there too." There's some allusion, but we don't know that for sure, so we can't really go there. So I think it's it's sufficient enough for us to talk about um, the darkness over the land of 
Israel. And we need to understand Jewish time, especially if you're new to the Bible, you may not understand. And John, John gives explanation for, his, um, for what he writes in the Gospel of John. We've seen that he's, he's, he's mainly writing to Gentile believers. He's not mainly writing to Jewish believers. That's why he explains, like for instance, in John chapter 4, when we're talking about the woman at, at the well, he says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, if you were writing to Jews, you would not have to give that little detail because they knew we don't, have, we don't deal with them. We don't have anything to do with them. They don't have anything to do with us. That was like the Hatfields and the McCoys. <laughs> you know, there's this enmity there and they would walk around Samaria to get to the Galilee area, go out of their way, and they would only go through Samaria during the feast, the three major feasts there. So that's something that, he, that you wouldn't know if you're a Gentile reading it, and that's why the, the Apostle John puts in there what he puts in there. So, so this is for, helpful for us to understand, this time frame. So the Jews' day, the Jewish day, began at 6 a.m., 6 a.m. was the first hour of the day. It was the first hour. So I know that some of us can do a little bit of math, and we can say that uh, the sixth hour would be noon, would be high noon. So the Lord Jesus was alive on the cross from, from the third hour, which would be 9 a.m., and he was on the cross to just after, I believe, 3 p.m. their time. So while he was on the cross, we need to understand this picture. While Jesus was on the cross, half of the time was in daylight, the daylight that would be in the spring, uh, you know, around the beginning of April, in Israel at that time, whatever, wherever the light was in, term, in terms of how all that worked out, from nine, the 9 a.m. sun would be out, and I don't know, I don't know where, what direction they were facing, I don't know all of that, but the sun would be out from 9 a.m. to noon, and then, and then what happened was God interrupted this supernaturally, as we'll get into. It was in darkness from noon to 3 p.m. And, and, and I can't even imagine what that would be like. Because so, I want to kind of set the scene, uh, t- taking into account what we've already looked at, what we've already studied. Uh, there would be, at, at the time that Jesus was being nailed to the cross, he would repeatedly say, as I said, we saw that from the tenses there, he would repeatedly say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do as they're nailing him to the cross. And obviously that had to affect the Romans to some extent. We're going to see the centurion say, uh, you know, truly this was uh, the son of God. Uh, we're going to, that's going to happen. Now, this at the same time, right after that, I should say, then the religious leaders showed up, probably the whole Sanhedrin, and they were mocking him, and they were fulfilling Scripture by saying, he saved others, let him save himself. You know, they did all these horrible, if you read, you read the, the different prophetic Scriptures in the Psalms, you'll see that they were fulfilling Scripture and didn't even realize it. They mocked him. Without mercy, they mocked him. And then also, as I said, the thieves on the crosses next to him, or around him, they mocked him. They joined him, both thieves. Uh, and, and so the Romans, I've no doubt, had said stuff as well. And so the, 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 this whole scene there where the thief that eventually uh, repents has, has a change of heart and asks Jesus uh, to save him, basically, he's watching Jesus on this cross. He's, he's being impacted by watching Jesus on the cross, and, and he's watching the God-man what it would be like to have the God-man be crucified, someone that's never sinned before, someone that didn't have a sinful nature. What would it be like to see God be crucified? This, both thieves got to see this, and one thief um, basically reacted in a healthy way. He saw his forgiving heart towards the Romans. He's, they saw his lack of fear. They saw his peace. They saw his lack of insults. You have nothing to lose now. You can insult the Romans all you want. You don't have to be afraid of anything. And no doubt that was a, a very common thing for them to insult the Romans and ev- anyone else that's around. They also got to see his love being extended as he's on that cross. He never stopped loving. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, if I give my body to be burned and I don't have love, it counts for nothing. Well, he wasn't having his body being burned, but he was being crucified and he was being killed. And, and you know that that love, especially as we've seen up to this point, was being extended uh, and is very potent there. So 
we, we, you know, this thief asked Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And Jesus responds with, Assuredly today you'll be with me in paradise. So then this, this happening, then the Marys and Salome, which was uh, James and John's mother, uh, they, the Mary, so met, there's, we went over this, who they were, but the, Mary of, uh, the mother of, of Jesus, Mary, of course, and another Mary, and, and then Salome was there. That was James and John's mom. They're the, that, they're, she's the one that actually tried to get them to have seats on the, his right hand and his left. They put their mom up to it. She, was, she did that. I wonder what she was thinking now. Because remember, he asked them, can you drink of the cup? And they said, we can. Well, this is the cup. So they're seeing right there, John is, and Salome is seeing, this is the cup that you, you, your son said that, you, that they could drink. That they, and, and, and obviously, that's something different than what they expected. And then so Jesus is there, and John, I mean, John there, Salome, the Marys, they come closer. They're there. Jesus looks down. He sees them. And he wants to make provision for his mother. So he says to Mary, woman, behold your son. And he says to, to John, behold your mother. And, and that was something between them. It says from that very moment, John took him into, that very hour, John took her into his house. So that was the fulfillment. That's what that meant. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't say that, that John was, from that point on, considering that, that Mary was the mother of God and now he's going to pray to her. Now he's going to, all these things. It doesn't say that the result of it is he went into with him to her to stay with him in his house. So all this happens that I just described. And there's, I'm sure there are other things that, that happen that aren't recorded. That, but Jesus is there. He's in incredible pain. He's dehydrated. He's been whipped. He's hardly had any sleep at all. Isaiah tells us that his face is marred beyond anything that we can imagine there, and, and that there's nothing that we would be attracted to. Uh, and, and so he's there, and, and, and all this has happened in the daylight, between nine and noon. All that's happened already during the daylight. Then at noon, something dramatic happens, something totally unexpected that they would never expect, they would never think would would. There would be no even any thought that this could possibly happen. And again, God is leading this whole thing. We've we followed this all the way since the garden. God's in control. Jesus is in control the entire time. God is still in control. And they're, they're hurling insults and all of that. But, but Jesus said, no one takes my life, but I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I can take it up again. So he's giving. He's offering his life. If you're a servant, you can't be taken advantage of. Because you're offering it already. If someone, no one can steal something you already have offered to them, right? So he's be the one, he's the one that's being um, the giver. He's the one that's being other centered. He's the one that's focused on others the entire time, even in the context of this incredible, credible wickedness that is happening. All the sham trials that we looked at, all the everything was just wrong. Everything was wrong, and you can look at this and go. Where was God? Where was God in all this? Where you know we can think about that. I mean, I get this question. You know, how how can bad things happen to good people? You know, and why would God allow this? And all we can get in. One thing we need to remember when we're tempted to ask those questions, and God can handle our questions. He's not afraid of our, um, our questions. But one of the things that we have to understand is whatever we we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's fallen, and and that and we're not going to escape even as believers. The, the effects of living in a fallen world. And that's why he tells us in Scripture that our citizenship is in heaven. You didn't know you had dual citizenship, but you do. You have citizenship in heaven, you have citizenship here. Or maybe you have triple citizenship. You know, you have people that have, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of Guam. Or no, that's, that doesn't count. You have to go somewhere else. Sri Lanka, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of Sri Lanka, America. And people sometimes have this long, like, how, do you, how can you be a citizen of that many countries? That's crazy. But, we're, but the main focus is that we're, we are, we have, our citizenship is in heaven. That's really where our home is. And as, as the old song says, we're just a passing through. We're pilgrims. That's why God's always working to get us to where we don't put too much roots down here. Because then we're not really useful for the kingdom. And it's a battle in all of us where we're struggling. You know, and He doesn't want us to invest in a losing stock. This world is a losing stock. Why would we want to invest in it? It's passing away. 
And, and so that's why Jesus said, don't tr- store your treasures on earth, but store your treasures in heaven. So unexpectedly, at noon, sun goes dark. Darkness. And they instantly see the stars. It's night all of a sudden. That's what it would appear like. It's night all of a sudden. This was not an eclipse. You know what's funny is that when people look at the Bible, it's funny because I sometimes I'll go through and I'll, I'll Google stuff. I'll look at Wikipedia and all this. And you look at, they just couldn't get it any more wrong, you know, on stuff. And usually they're always trying to find a natural explanation for something that's supernatural. God doesn't need, a, he, he can use natural phenomena to, to, to fulfill. He can do whatever he wants. But he doesn't need to. And so often you see people write these things and you're like, There's, if you could just have a molecule of faith mixed in <laughs> with your heart, you could see that if God could do the first verse of Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, create everything out of nothing, nothing else is too difficult. That's the ultimate thing, to create every, all of this order out of nothing. And now we're worried about how is it going to be dark unless there's an eclipse. Okay, learn the Bible just a little bit, these people I'm talking to, not you. You know all this stuff. This is, this is the Calvary Chapels and other places. Uh, Passover always occurred during a full moon. Try to have a solar eclipse during a full moon. You know how that works? It means that the, the full moon means on the wrong side of the earth uh, from, where, from where you're at. The first Passover was a full moon. Every, all, all the other Passovers were full moon. You can't have an eclipse from that, the way that that's worked out. And, and again, do you know of an eclipse that lasted three hours? Man, I remember as a kid in sixth grade. <laughs> what year would that be? I don't know, 1980? I'm guessing. I don't know, way back. But we had to make these little... I felt so gypped because we had, we, had, we had to make these little like thing boxes with a hole in it you know, and that's how we were supposed to look at the solar eclipse because we're supposed to have it shine through the hole in the box and then have it shine on the blacktop. And then you could see this little microscopic circle disappear. I'm like, man, I'm getting gypped. I just want to look at it. You know, there wasn't all these glasses that you could wear back then. I just want to look at it. And I think I may have. Maybe that's why I'm wearing glasses today. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just burning those retinas left and right, uh, left and right. You know, those those eye I'm sorry I'm kind of squirreling here but these these eye doctors left right left right and I just like it makes me go cross-eyed what they're telling me to do and then they're like no keep your eyes straight I'm like you're saying left right like I can't keep them straight help you know and and so they they uh they put up with me and take my money but anyway so um some people say that it would it, it wouldn't be totally dark though because it was because it was a full moon where does the moon get its light? It comes from the sun. So if the sun is darkened, there's no full moon at that time, right? So, um, you know, we have to really look at all of this because there wouldn't have been any torches. There wasn't any lanterns nearby. Most likely they're not going to, people aren't going out there at night and watching people on the cross there. So they'd have to find those things. But instantly they're all there and all of a sudden everything goes dark. And it's dark and the lights, I mean, that interrupts, that interrupts everything. There's no mocking. The Passover completely comes to a halt. Everything stops. The sacrifices in the temple stop. The, the, business, the business, the money changers and all the things they were doing to rip people off, all that stopped. Everything came to a standstill. Everything stopped. What just happened? What if right now the sun just went out? I think we'd be, I think some of you would wake up. I'm just kidding. You're not sleeping. Remember, ta- remember preaching is talking in someone else's sleep. Um, you'll get that on the way home, hopefully. But if everything just went out right now, just popped out, we would be shocked. We would be getting online. I don't even know if online would, would be working. <laughs> I don't know if the internet would be working or whatever if all of a sudden the sun went out. But that's what it would be like. Everything stopped. Luke tells us the sun was darkened. Luke adds this detail. And Luke was a physician. He's very science-based. It makes sense that that would happen, that he would um, be that detailed. But it's in the passive voice in the original, which means that the sun was being acted upon. The sun wasn't doing it. Whatever it was, the sun wasn't doing it. It was being done to the sun to make it happen. That's the language there. 
So God was acting upon the sun and darkening it, however he chose to do that. People get all into the, well, if he did that, then this would happen. They're like, yeah, he can suspend physics too. I don't know if you know that. He made the laws of physics. He can suspend those. He can do whatever he wants. He's God. So all of this happened there, and there was also an earthquake, we're told, and the temple veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, or the holy of holies, that was about 30 feet tall, uh, 15 feet wide, and, and like two, or two feet thick, that was ripped or rent from top to bottom, we're told, communicating that the priesthood is over. There's no need for going through a priest anymore, and you have total access to God through the sacrifice that, it, that has just taken place. That's, that's what it communicates. There's no priesthood anymore. There, it, we have total access, and no one loves more that we have the access that we have to God than God himself. Be, I mean, how, how would you feel if you had barriers between you and your children or your grandchildren, and you had barriers? You don't want any barriers. You want as nothing between you and them. You, they, you want total ac- them to have total access to you, and you want them to enjoy you as much as possible, and you want to enjoy them. But the, this whole system in the Old Testament was set up. God set it up. He's the one, it was his idea. He's the one that set it up. But he did that because it all pointed to Jesus. It was inferior to what Jesus was going to accomplish on that cross. It all, if you're new to the Bible, understand that all the slaughter of goats and bulls and all of that, um, I mean, those animals was that were there to point to Jesus. The lamb, before the foundation of the world, was slain so that we could have, so that the, so the Jews would be able to see this is the fulfillment of everything that's happened. That's why their eyes are blinded. They need God to remove the blindness from their eyes, Jewish people, to see that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything. So often they think that he was Roman or he was, because they think of the Catholic Church. They don't, they're so shocked that Jesus was a rabbi. I love watching testimony. In fact, we might start showing a few of them here, videos of their testimonies where they get, they, they're provoked to jealousy by, by believers. And they say, you know, they know more about my Bible than I did. It made me mad. You know, the Bible talks about provoking them to jealousy because God wants them to have that personal relationship with him and have their sin debt be, um, you know, sacrificed for. He wants that for them. And they just kept doing that. Now, in, they didn't record that in any history that that happened. And why would you if you're, if you're one of the priests that saw that and you made that connection? You know what's happening. And some of them were told in the book of Acts, many priests believed. So there were priests that, that heard about, maybe some of them actually witnessed this veil being torn from top to bottom. They saw it. And you, they don't want to admit that. And so they, they, they put that back up. They sew it back up, how, whatever they did. And they kept going. And then God finally fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus talked about with not one stone be left on another in the temple. And it would be uh, destroyed in A.D. 70. So this is a miracle that happens here. God darkened the sun and and um, and did this earthquake. And many people believe this earthquake is what opened these graves. And Matthew 27 talks about there are those that came out of their graves after the resurrection. They think that the graves were open right here. And then three days later is when he resurrected them uh, and they walked around for for a time. So everything stops, the mocking stops, everything. It's just total darkness. They wouldn't know how long this was going to last. If you think about that, they don't know how long it's going to last. And then and Jesus was cold. You know, the sun went down, it was cold. Um, again, he likely was naked. April is a really mild month over there. It can be hot, but it can be re- really cold as well. This is in the middle of the day. The, the sun would normally be at its hottest, um, I mean, in terms of temperature. So... Um, and, and also from Jesus' perspective, he's not seeing those that are there to support him when he's on this, um, when he's on the cross and it goes dark. And and uh, But again, with all of this, as bad as all this was, as bad as all that he went through physically and mentally and emotionally, all this physical, emotional, mental suffering was not the main thing, I believe, that Jesus was dreading when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's saying, let this cut pass if there's any other way. I believe it was the punishment. It was the wrath. It was what happened between him and the Father that we can't, we can't know about. 
We, can't, we can have theories. We can guess at. We don't know what happened. The sin of the world was placed on him. That was the part that was the worst because when you really look at what that meant, we're talking about every sin for every human being that's ever lived or will live. It hasn't even been born yet. Babies that will be born tomorrow, he died for their sin. We don't, he died for all of our sins. All the sins we'll ever commit, he died. He died for. He took the wrath. We're talking about the most wicked people we can think of. ISIS, Hitler, Osama bin Laden. Go through the whole list of the worst wicked people. Stalin. Like You could go through a whole long, um, in your mind, he went through all that. All the sins of not just comm- commission, but omission. The sins that we were, good things we were supposed to do that we didn't do. Every single sin, all the wrath that we deserved. Everything that we deserve to be, pl- our punishment, our sentence, everything was placed on him. And, and God is holy. The Father is holy. He can't look upon sin. And so when the sin of the human history was placed on the Lord Jesus, and, and people say, oh, he only died for the elect. He only died for those sins. And I just believe that First John says the opposite. He not only died for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. We're told. So he died, he took that punishment for everyone. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Un- unbelievable that, he, that that would happen. That sums it up. He who, he, for he, the Father, made him, the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's really important in that verse, the last two words, in him. We have no righteousness apart from him. Isaiah said that our righteousness is like filthy rags to to, to God. And that's our best performance, to say nothing of our sin. So um, that's clear what happened. That's the sin of the world being placed on him. Isaiah 53, verse 6, we're told, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Laid on him the iniquity of us all. He said that 400 and something years before the birth of Christ. Now we're told in verse 46, and about the ninth hour, so about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this is Psalm 22, verse 1. This is what, and you read Psalm 22, verse 1. David, inspired by the Spirit, he said that. Now, of course, he meant it for himself, um, but he didn't realize, probably, we don't know that for sure, that he was actually prophetically writing about what would happen inside the Messiah's heart and mind at that time. It's actually, you get more vivid detail. This is how God's amazing God's Word is. You get more vivid detail in Psalm 22 than you do actually reading the gospel accounts of Jesus on the cross, of what was going on inside of him. It's a great study. But this is not, he's just not quoting Psalm 22 to fulfill prophecy. This is not just, okay, I'm going to fulfill prophecy. This is, and this is what we don't know. This is totally mysterious and full of mystery for us. This is sincere. Now, Jesus is omniscient, and he's the one, his spirit is the one who inspired David to write this. But yet somehow this was a sincere prayer. It's a sincere cry. So I don't understand how this could be, how he could say this. But he was forsaken. That's what we can know. He was rejected. He was, the Father's face turned away from him. He was um, abandoned. He was rejected there. And apparently there's some part of this to the extent of it or whatever, that was a surprise to the Lord Jesus. Or he didn't think it would happen to this extent or this long. Or I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. He says it in um, Aramaic there. Eli, Eli is Hebrew, but Lama Sabachthani is, is, uh, is Aramaic. And, and, and the other gospel writer says, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. And that's the pure Aramaic. But some of them didn't understand what he was saying. And they, they thought that he was calling for Elijah to help him because Elijah never died. So they thought he, Elijah was available to come down and help. 
And, and so they thought maybe he's going to call on Elijah to come off the cross. And they said, he saved others, but he can't save himself. And in that sense, that's true. He can't. To save, those, to save mankind, to pay the price for mankind, he couldn't save himself. They didn't realize how true their statement was. But he said with a loud, notice he says in the middle of verse 46, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Jesus knew he didn't have to say it loud for the Father to hear him, but he's wanting everyone else to hear this. I mean, or he just wanted, he just was passionate and wanted to say it that loud to the Father. Um, so again, we don't know fully what happened. There is mystery to it. And I'm, I'm, I'm for one, and totally comfortable with saying I don't know stuff about the Scriptures. There's stuff all the time I don't know about the Scriptures. Now, Tony, he knows everything. I'm just kidding. He doesn't. But, um, you know, we all fall short. We all have limited knowledge. But there's something that he didn't expect or the extent of it he didn't expect. And it was part of, the, it was part of what was necessary. Remember, we're told that it pleased the Father to bruise him. It pleased the Father. Why did it please the Father when he loved his son? Because God is just. God is just. This was justice being served. Sometimes we want justice, but we don't want it for ourselves, if we're honest, because we'd be wiped out. If God really judged us and gave us justice, be careful how much you ask for justice. Because, you know, that same judgment, you know, I mean, we have to think about what, we're, what we would suffer if, if we got what we deserved. That's why we're called to pray for our enemies. And, and, but God is satisfied with this. It was satisfactory. It was, it, was, um, it, was, it was appropriate. The Father is holy. You know, we have a holy God. We serve and love a holy God. It's all based on morality. That's why it's not, there's no moral relativism. There's no relative morality. God is, God's the one that lays out what morality is. And, and, and so the sacrifice that was necessary for us included having the father within the Godhead somehow turn his face away uh, in that moment because he can't look upon sin and the sin of the world was being placed on him. And, and Jesus always having that connection with the father from his mother's womb had that connection. And, it, and somehow it was altered temporarily and it was, it was something that he didn't, apparently didn't expect and the father needed to forsake him. The father needed to reject him. He, the father, father needed to turn his face away from that. It was part of the wrath that we deserve. Jesus received. John would later write in his first epistle, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That I, I referenced that earlier. Propitiation, that word, means exactly satisfying payment. It's the satisfying payment. It satisfied the Father. Because He's just as much just as He is love. We always hear about God is love, and He is love. And, and unbelievers only want to talk about the love of God, that God is love. They'll even quote that to you. But they don't want to talk about how God is just. And God's laid out for all of us what His expectations are related to morality. And God gets to decide you ever ask an unbeliever, is it okay for God to decide what morality is <laughs> and, and see what they say? So often they have a hard time with that. But if God is God, of course he has the right to lay out what is sin and what isn't. And that's the thing that people hate the most. They want to decide what's right and wrong. They don't want to submit their lives to what God says. God says, this is my morality. And the standard is perfection, meaning that you have to be perfect. If you've ever been less than perfect, you fall short and need the Savior, which qualifies all of us. The world thinks that we believe that we're going to heaven because you're here today. The world thinks we, that we believe in God, we do righteous works, we're good people, all these things, and we're doing that to outweigh our sin, and, and we're being better you know, enough, we're being good enough to outweigh our sin. But the Bible said knows nothing of that. I tell people that all the time, and they're shocked to learn that. I say, do you know that we don't believe that? No, I, I thought you guys went to church all the time and did all this stuff to try to be good people and, and earn your way to heaven. I'm like, I know. I know that you believe that. That's not true. That's not the basis for salvation. That's part of what the, explaining the gospel means. 
So that satisfying payment, he also redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul wrote this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So he became a curse for us. And, and, and so that should produce worship in us. That should make us want to serve him and love him even, even more. When Jesus hung on that cross, he became a curse for us that we might be freed from the penalty of not perfectly obeying the law of Moses. The law of Moses was never intended as a means by which we get to heaven for the Jew or for us because we have the work of the law written on our hearts, we're told in Scripture. So it, it was meant to be a mirror to show them, you need a Savior, you need a Savior, you need a Savior, you need a Savior, you can't measure up to this, you can't measure up to this. The Apostle Paul misunderstood that before he was the Apostle Paul. And they, these Jews thought, I can obey the law of Moses, all 613 laws, in addition to my, our man-made laws, I can obey all those things and earn this right standing with God. And they were completely wrong. And the Apostle Paul would have to go into the wilderness for three years to have Jesus reteach him about the gospel and about certain scriptures. And that was the basis upon which he wrote the epistles and wrote Romans and wrote all these books, that, these epistles that helped our theology understand that it's always been by faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. And all who trust in Jesus are, are sons of Abraham, Paul would write. Why? Because God imputed righteousness to our account based on our faith in Jesus Christ. The same as he did with Abraham when he, when he placed his faith in what God said, God decided that that was the basis. Now, he didn't earn anything. He just decided to, to count that, in a, like an accounting term, account that as righteousness. Now, as I close here, I just want to mention that if you've, if you've been rejected, if you've been abandoned, sometimes people refer to it as abandonment issues, We've been rejected. Jesus knows all about that. He knew that before the cross. Well, he knew that even before he came to earth because he's God. He's God. But when he came to earth, it, John, we've seen this as we've gone through the gospel of John. He went to his own, but his own received him not. They rejected him. He knew about rejection. He was a, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. But then on this cross, he was rejected and abandoned by the Father by the, point, the one that was the most important to him, he was rejected. So we can't get mad at God of why he allows evil when he included his son in the whole, the whole program or the whole experience of evil in this world. He didn't spare his son from allowing him to go through it. And because of that, Jesus knows as our faithful high priest, he can identify with us experientially, not just omniscience because he's who he is, but experientially he can identify with that and know what that's like. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 tells us this. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he will never forsake us. That's the one thing that we can know 100%. Because he was willing to be forsaken and rejected. And because of his finished work, and we placed our faith in that. Now we're in this relationship with him and he will never leave us nor forsake us. And why does he link this with covetousness? Well, I think the obvious answer to me when I look at it is, why? what's to covet if we have him? He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We have him. That's enough. Jesus plus nothing is enough. That's the thing that we need to understand. That's why it's not about what he gives us as much as we love that and as much as he loves to give it. it he's the reward. It's not what he offers. He's, he's the prize. Not what he offers. He's the prize. And as you grow older in the Lord, the more you realize and value that. And that's, you come to the point in your life when you're between two sheets and it's your last day and you're there and, and all you have is Jesus, but you realize that's all I've ever needed and that's all I've ever wanted. And I get to go be with him now. That's taking the sting out of death. That's, that's having victory over death, is, is enjoying knowing that I'm going to be with him any moment and that's all I need. I want to close by reading a portion, another portion from Psalm 22. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. And this part is I want to focus on the last part of 14. 
My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. We have no idea what he went through having the sin of the world placed on him, our sin, which helps us understand the price of sin. And that should work in our lives to increasingly hate sin, increasingly want to be more and more holy because of what he went for us. That's why in Titus it says, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Grace teaches us. That grace being extended to us melts our hearts because we know his heart was suffered the way that it did, having the sin of the world placed on him. Let's pray. Lord, we just, it's hard for us. It's hard for us to think about this. But we know that your, your heart understands that we're so limited and you love us so much. Would you use these verses and what the Lord Jesus did for your purposes in our lives, Lord, ongoing. Help us to ponder and think about what you went through. Can't imagine what it was like to hang on that cross, Jesus, in total darkness, not seeing your mother anymore, not seeing John, not seeing the Mar- Mary and, Sol- and, um, and um, Salome, and just being there cold and having having all of that sin placed on you and taking the wrath that we deserved. Would you please help us to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called? We know it's only by your grace and by your power. Thank you for our family here. Thank you to look at these things and ponder these things together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.